Logos is the icon of the Father, and man is the icon of God. We are the image of God. Dire Wave 3. Dire Wave 3.
Dire Wave. Three. Oh, yeah, what's up, y'all? My dang window captured. None died on me. This keeps happening. It just never fails. It never fails when it comes to Apple integrating with these other formats. And... Especially when it comes to live streaming, for whatever reason. There we go. We fixed it. For whatever reason, Apple just... I mean, the people that make OBS and all that, right? Like, it's just not made for Apple stuff. So, it takes them forever to fix all the bugs. They put out a... They sent me a tech message this week talking about... Um, or last week, <clears throat> talking about how they, they had created this new thing about guests that can join, and that makes it easier on live streams. And then uh, we tried it out, and it worked fine. And then as soon as I tried to use it, <laughs> it doesn't work. And they, had, yeah, it's a bug in their whole thing. Anyway, it's a bug in their whole thing. A bug in their whole thing. 
Today, I'm going to be a bug in your whole thing. Uh, today, we are doing the rest of what we were talking about yesterday. And there was so much information, so much material from yesterday that I didn't get to it all. So that's why we're, we're catching up on it tonight. So, grab your loved ones. Grab a bag of meat snacks. Grab a bag of Beyond Meat snacks, I should say, to be a good global citizen, to avoid being a bigot. Grab your Beyond Meat snacks. Grab your bugs. A nice little pocket of crickets. A nice little pocket of Cheeto cricket, Cheeto dusted crickets. Grab a nice mug of Four loco. And let's get into it baby doll now on, on the good news tip got a little bit of good news uh, our buddy Tim Gordon remember him remember Tim uh, as I called him gadonk gadonk well we had a <clears throat> an amicable DM exchange turns out we're friends again <laughs> or now I don't guess we ever were friends we're we're basically on good terms so that's a good development. It's much better to be on good terms with people, especially even if there are vehement disagreements. Sure, we all know this. We all know we disagree with um, the trads and all that. So this week, as you guys know, though, is Papacy Week, and <clears throat> we're going to be working through different topics. Of course, uh, as, you, as we noted the other day, uh, anybody who wants to reach out and be on good terms and I talked to Tim about it and he was cool about it the good terms are basically in terms of interactions right nobody has to take down any old videos I don't care about old attack videos none of that bothers me for future interactions uh, the the terms are just going to be that look we avoid people's wives and and if anybody wants to make fun of me if you want to do impressions of me I don't care and none of that stuff bothers me uh, if you think I'm a I'm a goofy goober. You're a goofy goober. We're the goofy goobers. I don't care. You can. I loved Mario's impression of my snorting. It was funny. The fake debate. None of that stuff bothers me. Make all the impression videos you want. I'm actually impressed when somebody can do an impression of me because it seems like it's kind of a difficult impression. But then when people do the snorting and whatnot, it actually comes out all right. So, all right. Okay. <laughs> I'll take snorting as an. Uh, uh, an impression now the other thing because everybody always fusses about it because um, OBS and Streamlabs don't run that well on a Mac I have to get these <clears throat> plugins and these patches that are like made by you know dudes in mama basement and so this plug-in patch half the time it doesn't work so half the time it I have to restart my computer to get the patch to upload to be active and then half the time it shuts off on its own in terms of the audio device settings so the reason that it doesn't come out very loud everybody says turn it up turn it up bring the noise turn it up bring the noise the reason it doesn't turn up is because it's turned all the way up see let's look we got all these cardinals and saudis and weirdos in here you see it's turned all the way up and in the internal settings it's turned all the way up so for whatever reason the black hole which is called the patch black hole two channel the black hole two channel patch doesn't put out enough volume i don't know why it's cranked up all the way in obs you have the option to even try to crank it up higher than 100 percent, and it doesn't work you can't go beyond 100 so on a lot of these older videos, if the sound is itself kind of low, there's nothing I can do about it. I can try to turn myself down to like match. That's what somebody said to do. Yeah, we can try to do that. But sometimes I've been unclear if my volume on the mic, if that's a master volume, if that even affects the videos that are playing output. I've never been clear about that. I don't think it does. Cause I, I could turn it, 
all the way down and you guys can tell me if you hear this okay so let's try one of these i'm going to turn my volume down i'll play this vatican video and you guys tell me if you hear it that way we'll know that my master volume on the mic doesn't affect the multi-channel volume of the of the videos all right turning it down now so of several world religions gathered at the vatican to sign a joint appeal on climate change which will be presented to global leaders at the United Nations Conference, COP26, in Glasgow in November, urging them to step up their efforts to stop climate change. Among those present were Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, and delegations representing the Russian Orthodox Church and the Coptic Orthodox Church. Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism were also represented. The Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, who in 2019 signed the document on human fraternity with Pope Francis, All right. Could you guys hear that clip? Was it loud enough, though? Loud enough, not loud snuff. <laughs> it's quiet. Nearly inaudible. Hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to try playing it. It's a little quiet. Let's try it now with my master volume turned up to normal normal sound. All right, so you guys let me know if this is any different, and then we'll know. ...was also in attendance. Nearly 40 religious figures spoke on behalf of their communities, highlighting the importance of working together to address environmental issues. And we need this dialogue in order simply to be, simply to breathe, simply to love one another. I think they have, as I said, a unique voice in being able to talk to their populations, but also to world leaders. During the meeting, Pope Francis offered three concepts to guide the reflection on this joint project. Openness to interdependence and sharing, the dynamism of love, and the... Was that any different or was it the same? Still the same? Okay. So what this means is that my master volume can't, doesn't affect this, the videos, right, on the mic. And it means that in OBS, um, it doesn't matter either because this runs through a patch that that's the maximum that the patch puts out. So unless the videos happen to be themselves overly loud, <clears throat> there's no solution to this problem for a Mac. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, so like the... The weird thing is that I guess a lot of you guys aren't listening on a phone because, you know, like iPhones have pretty good speakers because anytime I've, ha I've had these people on, it's always easy for me to, I can't skip the patches. There's no way to make this work without the patch. That's what I'm trying to tell you guys. Like this has been a problem for years and I've worked and worked and worked to try to solve it. And I'm not going to invest thousands of dollars in going back to PCs because PCs suck. And even if Macs suck, PCs suck worse. So that's that's the issue that we're at, right? Like, there's no other way to... No, I'm not going to hold the microphone up to the speakers. I'm not doing that. Um, and I'm not gonna invest I mean, it took me... You guys understand how many hours it took me to find the patch and to make it <laughs> to where I could even play these videos? It's just because coping... Yeah, okay, that's, I'm coping. I mean, if any, if there's people who have the tech problems or the tech uh, skills, feel free to reach out. I mean, like I'm, I'm open to solutions to this problem to make it, um, yeah, but see if I crank down my master volume and people turn it up, we can try that. Is that better? Right now? I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have time to go into learning a bunch of operating systems. I know a lot of you guys have that time. I don't do that. I don't have time for that. Right. Turn it up. It's turned up all the way. Do you guys understand that? I've had to spend hours. Do you guys understand how many hours it took me just to find black hole that works? Right. I don't know what Arch is. I'll install Arch. <laughs> Put in subtitles and read it. That's funny. So how's my, um, yeah, I mean, I may have to just switch to StreamYards, right? Like maybe StreamYards will be better, but the problem is like, um, anybody got time for that? Yeah. See, like on a phone, it sounds fine. It sounds fine. Right. So I've got my volume turned down 
Tell me if I match the clip now, at least loosely. Call to respect, but he didn't read the rest of his prepared speech in order to let other people speak. E per non usare del tempo che è necessario perché tutti parlino, lascio nelle vostre mani la trascrizione, voi potete leggerla e così andiamo avanti in questa celebrazione. Grazie. Pope Francis then presented the signed appeal to Alec Sharma, president of COP26, and to Luigi Di Maio, Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. At the end of the interventions, each person poured soil on the roots of... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is my voice anywhere near close to that one? Yeah, I do. I love my loud shirts. What do you expect? Yeah. So it's just going to depend on the clips, right? Like some clips are maybe a little louder than others like this one's probably a little louder let's see so you'll notice right i've got it all the way up let's try it has the power to include or exclude segments of society but first the uae is home to a diverse population of more than 200 nationalities how is that could y'all hear a uh, makeup faced arab woman could y'all hear that Your shirt is four times louder. <laughs> so we got a bunch of new boomers that have joined us from uh, presumably the popular interviews that we've done in the last uh, week. And she's quieter. Well, I mean, at that point, there's, I mean, there's just nothing else that can be done. If, if, I mean, it's all cranked up to the max in every possible setting. So it was better. Yeah, again, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, so I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you, you're, fr you're free to go somewhere else, somewhere else, Mikhail, so goodbye. Um, if, I, if I could show you OBS, you could see what I mean. Like, the in the mixer for Black Hole, it's cracked, cranked all the way up, but every output for any video only gets to about medium strength in the it's bar. Enough. religious coexistence is a plan for the capital Abu Dhabi called the Abrahamic family house. Rebecca McLaughlin Easton looks in. Anyway, we're going to move on after this because again, I've tried to explain this to people and they don't get it. And hardly anybody even knows and does this kind of tech stuff. So look, look at what I'm, what I'm explaining. And then we can all just shut up and move on. Go put some damn headphones on. Do you see that where it says, black hole two channel right there see that you see how that's cranked all the way up to the max do you see that green bar it never gets above about halfway and in the advanced settings you cannot crank black hole above 100 percent like so tristan had a great idea to put it up to 200 percent, and that doesn't work so if anybody has any ideas, and if I just have to do, start using Streamlabs, I mean StreamYard, I'll do that, right? Um, I guess I can still use Streamlabs as my Super Chat function. So, but part of the reason we had to do all this was because we got demonetized, right? So we had to figure all this out as the backup. But as you can see, Black Hole does not go any higher. Like that's it. And it's just not made to run on a Mac is the, the essence of it. And neither is stream 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 labs and stream labs puts out a ticket explaining this to me right they're like yeah we constantly have mac issues we're just not you know people just don't do live streaming on macs so here we are now i'm not going to download every video and uh, it's, that's way too much of a, of a hassle i'm not doing that yeah i know i'm going to talk about cameron in the video he's it's in the show description, Cameron. So loop back, uh, amoeba loop back. All right, let me write that down because if that works better than loop back, if that works better than um, what I'm doing. And that's why I always put these videos into the chat anyway. So if you're going to bitch about the sound and all that, which again, I've done spent hours, days on this problem for years. <clears throat> Turn up your hearing aids, boomers. 
Um, there's the original clips. See how you can just go watch the clips yourselves because there's no there's no solution to this other than if somebody wants to send me thousands of dollars to go buy a bunch of PCs and you know learn, redo all this stuff, feel free. Uh, but anyway, all right, let's move on. So I'm not going to replay all this dumbass video, but uh, the other thing too is so but when, coming back to the issue with the, all the trad. So like. Uh, fat jokes are not going away. Um, saying butthole, asshole, fart is not going away. Shit. Uh, but if people want me to try to be more patient and uh, than that, yes, I will. I will do that. So I'm going to be more patient uh, and with God's grace. So how's that? But, and that's why, because I don't care if people want to make jokes about me. Let's get back to the topics. I did want to touch on a lot of the, um, as we said, the material that, that we didn't get to yesterday. And uh, I got further and further into the reviewing this old interview from Paul Williams. And man, there's so many like golden moments in this. It's almost like, I need to play the whole video, uh, but I'm not going to do that because, um, 500 people in the chat will bitch about the sound, right? So it doesn't matter how many times we explain this issue. Like it doesn't matter. So there's, there's the video that you as adults can go watch on your own. And then when it comes to the long intros, I still get, so we had like 2000 new people, new subscribers this week because of the popular videos, which is really good for me. Um, so a lot of people I think are new and they're like, why is he playing stream live stream that allows people to get the notification and to come into the live stream because the way that I make money as a living on live streams is by people coming to the live stream. Boomers, do you hear me? I'm not joking. There's literal boomer names. Deborah. Why's he got 10 minutes of songs of synthesizer? Why's the intro so long? Take your mouse and move the cursor until there's no more musics. No more technos. This is not email, boomers. This is not bitcoins. You're not going to lose your emails by moving the cursor over. You're not going to have to invest in Bitcoins. I know that's terrifying. Boomers are scared of Bitcoins. That's a dang Ponzi. It ain't real. That's all you got to do. Now, if these clips are low volume, there's a thing on the side of the phone, on the side of your flip phone, <laughs> <laughs> that's an up volume right that goes that makes volume up that makes you loud like my shirt the bo the button below that on a phone it make it go down and if you don't like that loud synthesizer music you can push those buttons and make that synthesizer go away it literally makes it go away and then when you're ready to hear my beautiful voice, which I'm still sick. I'm still snorting. I'm still snorting. Snorter than I've ever been. I'm still standing. Is that Billy Joel? I don't even know. I know that's a boomer tune. I don't even know. But people are getting their feelings hurt. It's just jokes, man. So many people are thin skinned, man. They can't handle it. They just can't. That's why I was saying that, you know, blood sports was good for like initiating people into, uh, getting their feelings hurt or <laughs> getting, getting made fun of because I, I started, I was talking to uh, somebody about this this last week. And I was saying, you know, a lot of guys, they don't go through the normal guy rituals, right? Not guy, Richie guy rituals, guy rituals. Like I'm being serious, like asking out a girl. And uh, this person was involved in, churchly ministry and he was talking about how a lot of young men 
they're so used to social media interactions that they don't know anything about like how to approach a girl and ask her out in real life. And uh, so in other words, uh, I'm going to sound like a boomer right here. Ironically, a lot of these Gen Z people, they've not gone through the normal processes of what men are supposed to go through. For example, you know, being ribbed by your buddies, being made fun of. Right. And that's why they can't, they have these mental breaks because they're not used to being made fun of. And so if somebody makes a joke, you know, it's like the end of the world. Um, but at least, you know, when I was growing up in my day in the night, like in the late nineties, there was still a lot of normalcy left, like a lot of the normal ways of living for men and women. And it was, this is prior to, to internets, right? So, I mean, internet was like only at the library in 1995 or whatever. And it was like the worst dial up and it was all, you know, GeoCities pages. Like you go and find a GeoCities page of Alanis Morissette and a little dancing gif of a baby. <laughs> Cause that's all there is. Sorry. Right? Like, uh, Oasis Alanis Morissette pages on GeoCities. That was the, the extent of the internet using Netscape Navigator and Alta Vista. And little like skeletons. <laughs> little skeleton gifts. Dancing baby. Remember the little dancing baby? Where he does the little thing. So nobody gave a damn about the internet, right? In the 90s. If you were into the internet, you were a nerd, dude. Nobody want to talk to you. So, like, on a normal Friday night, you're getting ready to go out. And this is every Friday night and Saturday night for years. Why are you going out on a Friday and Saturday night? Well, you want to go get beer. Uh, perhaps you want to get your buddies to go get you some, a little smoke smoke, too. Right? Because we're talking about wild high school boys. But what are you really after? You're not after just getting beer for its own sake. You're after a dang chick, dude. You're after girls. And that's a normal male process to learn social cues, social interactions, blah, 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 blah. That's what you do. I don't even like country music, but I was watching a bunch of country music videos. And uh, ironically, like what's in a lot of the country music videos that were po that have been popular in the last few years. That's like, that's the normal, like high school experience that I grew up with, right? And I'm sure a lot of my audience did too, because I think the demographics of my audience breakdown is like mainly people 35 to 50 higher, you know, college ed and above. That's the majority of this audience. And it's like 90% dudes. <laughs> but I was watching some, I don't even, I don't even know these country people like Jason Aldean. He was like super big 10 years ago and he was singing about, on my dirt road, where I drank my first beer, and where I asked out my first coochie, and where I did all the partying back on the dirt roads. This kind of stuff. That's high school, man. And that's a process you should go through. Otherwise, like, you're going to have problems. You know what I'm saying? And speaking of country stars, I just saw Dirks Bentley at the mall. Me and Jamie were over there at Nordstrom's and I don't even like country. I'm like, that's freaking Dirks Bentley over there. And sure enough, it was. And I was like, man, I should say something to him. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say to him because <laughs> I don't really listen to country very much. I listened to like outlaw country, but I knew one Dirks Bentley song, which I like. How's it go? What's the. He's got that one that's really popular, Drunk on a Plane. And then there's another one that he has that I do like. All day long, all day long, I've been sitting here with the TV on. That one, that one's all right. I like that one. But I was like, what am I going to say to that dude? Hey, all day long, dude. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. So it was it was very similar to the time I, I saw Alanis Morissette, right? When we were filming... Uh, Hollywood decoded and she was at the hotel and we were both checking out at the same time, like five in the morning. It was awful. I was like standing there checking out with Alanis Morrison. I was like, 
I'll be, I'll be dang, ain't that ironic? <laughs> and, uh, but I couldn't, other than that, like I couldn't think of anything else to say. So, but she had a giant diamond ring. So I guess she's, she's living good from all that irony money. Isn't, isn't it ironic? Don't you think? It's like rain. Anyway, we're not even talking about Roman Catholicism. What are we even talking about? I'm talking about the 90s? How did I get on? Oh, this was about how uh, people get their feeling hurt. People a little on the soft, soft side. And uh, a lot of passive aggressive people out there. So does that mean that I think I'm a tough guy? No. I'm not trying to say I'm some kind of tough, tough guy. Although I have been uh, uh, working out a lot more consistently lately. So uh, we, we are getting a little bit uh, of an increase in the guns range. But by no means is that some sort of tough guy. I'm not out here trying to fight people. Although if there was a YouTube fight that was offered, I'm down. If we find the right person in my like weight class and all that kind of stuff, shit, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do a dang uh, Sam Hyde type of fight. I'm not saying I would fight Sam Hyde. I'm saying I would fight somebody in the YouTube sphere in the domain that I'm in. And it can't be somebody who secretly has a freaking, you know, black belt and has been training for 50 years, right? Like my weight class, my weight division, and, you know, not secretly some you know, UFC master or some shit like that. Cause that's not fair. So, oh, that's another thing you should go through, right? You should go through. Yeah. I'll, I'll go, I go train with Sam. Huh? That'd be fun. A guy should go through getting beat up and beating up people in, in his youth. That's a, a thing a dude should go through. Cause I remember the first time I got into a fight, it was this little scrappy dude and I beat him up. And then the next time I got into a fight, I got beat up, like got the crap beat out of me. And it was a dude who was like a little tank dude, the little tank dudes, like them little short tank dudes. They're the hardest dudes to fight because, well, in this guy's case, uh, his dad had beat him his whole life. So he was a badass. And then I also found out he was cheating too, because he, he would snort Coke before the fights that he, he got into a lot of fights. Right. So he was an experienced fighter with a, with a, with a mean daddy. <laughs> <laughs> which is cheating <laughs> and and he would do coke before he fought and i was just a freaking nerd that watched i wasn't a nerd like i was an uh, athlete i was on the basketball team and all that but uh i wasn't prepared for the fight and i watched a bunch of van damme and steven seagal movies so i thought i was gonna win because i was like studying the movies <laughs> uh like blood sport right and so i was like I'm over here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a freaking roundhouse on this dude because he was a little short, stocky tank dude. I was like, man, if my if my roundhouse connects to that little short ass bobblehead, he I'm he's done, dude. And so I tried a couple kicks at the beginning of the fight, and it actually intimidated him. He was like freaking out and scooting back, and then uh, he got in close to me, and he got me good in the jaw, and then I fell back and hit my head on the concrete. So that knocked me out. So that was a short fight. And then there was another fight in high school where I got sucker punched at a party. And I didn't know what was happening because it was really cold. I was walking into the basement of the party and a dude came out. The bunch of people were walking out as I was walking in. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was walking into. My hands were in my freaking coat because it was freezing cold. And this big old dude just comes at me. Bah! And he knocked, he knocked me down the hill. I went rolling down this hill and I was like, what the heck just happened? And I was like, stop, stop. What's going on? So I lost that fight, but that one doesn't count either. Cause that was like a total sucker punch. And everybody knew he sucker punched me too, which everybody thought was really kind of slimy. Um, anyway, so I'm like one and two in high school fights, but then two of the loss, one of those two losses doesn't really count. If a dude just like sneaks up and punches you in the face when you got your hands in your coat knocked you down a hill anyway maybe i should try to get that dude to come come to the creator clash and have a have a match <laughs> me him in the octagon 
he's probably a big old fat dude now, so I don't know. Like he, I might be able to beat him now, but who knows? Um, but no, I'm not. I'm not a tough guy. How do we get on all this? Oh, because people don't go through the normal male rituals. That's what I was trying to say. Figuring out how to uh, ask out a girl, figuring out how to spit some game, figuring out how to mac. You got to do that. You got to learn that in high school. If you're going to try to get a wife or a woman as you get older. Now, a lot of dudes now are like, I'm not doing anything. I'm not participating. I'm going to step on out of that process. Count me out. And I think in orthodoxy, you have like, you know, if people want to go that route, you know, you can go into monasticism. You know, you can, you can investigate that, that, uh, trajectory, that vocation. Anyway, Jay versus, well, I'm afraid Stanley would blow that breath of life. You don't believe in the breath of life. Stanley would blow that breath of life on me and I would pass out. Because I'm guessing his breath of life smelled like damn Funyuns. Don't you think? Don't you think Stanley's breath of life would, stand, would smell like a Funyun? I mean, that dude looks like he smells like a Funyun. So, no, no telling what his breath smelled like. Uh, papal states. Yo, I'm in that papal state of mind, dog. I'm in a papal state of mind. Um, what else? See, now the boomers are all over here like, I kind of like this kid now. He's over here. To- he's talking about how they don't need to be snowflakes. Hey, we're equal opportunity offenders over here. We make fun of the boomers and we make fun of the the snowflakes which is like already an outdated term right you got your your granddad calls you up and he's like now don't be a damn snowflake tell me about this ethereum how do i buy that and it's like no you do you're already like when 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 your your boomer grand granddad is calling about ethereum it's too late like ethereum's already gone dude <laughs> so uh, yeah, Cameron. Oh, yeah, that'd be a great match. I'd love to. I would fight Cameron Bertuzzi in a creator clash. That'd be fun. In fact, I don't even know like what hit. Like he might be some secret fighter, dude. I don't get the impression that he is. But yeah, I would have a. I would have a fist fight with uh, Cameron Bertuzzi if he, if he wanted to do that in the creator clash boxing match or some kind of grappling thing. I don't even know grappling. I feel like I could grapple that dude. Um, but I do have a video we're going to get on, get to in a second about Cameron's conversion. Uh, I'm not going to play Cameron, but I'm going to play his uh, versus Chun-Li. I'm more of a... Um, who's the blonde dude? Finish him. Street Fighter. I'm trying to think of who's the blonde guy in Street Fighter. Timothy Gordon. Well, we made up. So Timothy and I made up. We're on good terms now. So I'm not going to fight Timothy Gordon. Um, plus, we were laughing about Creed. He said he's been called the Creed dude since he was in high school. <laughs> so we were laughing about that, which I was like, dang, I thought I had a creative, uh, creative, witty comment. He's like, nah, dude, that's old school. I've been hearing that for like 20 years. Um. Ken Guile, that's what I'm trying to think. Ken and Guile, exactly. I'm more of a Guile kind of dude over here. Charlie? Who's Charlie? Who am I going to fight? I don't know, man. We need to set up a creator clash. Have me, have me fight somebody. I, I, I would do it. Seriously, I would do it. I mean, dude, Andy Worski went and tried to fight somebody. I'll do it. I'm not trying to say I want to fight Andy. I'm saying I don't think Andy's in my weight class, but I'm saying there's somebody in my weight class and age and all that kind of stuff that is of the same level. Yeah, I would do that. That'd be fun. And I wouldn't even care if I got beat up. I've been beat up before, dude. Who cares? I've been beat up. Well, if you count the sucker punch twice. (laughs) So anyway, Google find you better put your head on a swivel, tough guy. <laughs> better look behind your back, tough guy. Put your head on a swivel. Eddie Bravo, are you serious? Like I said, I can't fight some 
I'm not fighting some UFC trained dude. Give me a break. A rap battle with Lofton. That'd be funny. Uh, Lofton actually does have a, a rap song. It's pretty funny if you've seen if you haven't seen that. <clears throat> I actually think I could do a, a joke rap song better than Lofton. I actually think I could. I don't even care about rap, but I think I could actually do a better rap song than Lofton. But I mean, remember when we tried to do a little bit of spitting bars with Tristan? Little AIDS? Pfft. Give me a break. He was done in a freaking three days. That dude was out. <laughs> and then I dropped some of the biggest hits you've heard of 2022, right? Gossiping, Pay Piggy. I mean, we're over here. We're dropping hits. These people are talking shits, right? With no hits. So there we go. Who won that? Me. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, be thinking about who, who, who could I fight? Who could we try to get a fight going with in terms of some sort of boxing or grappling or I don't know what. Um, let's get into this or we'll never get into it. I'll just sit here. I'll just sit here joking around on a chill stream all day talking about crazy stuff. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Pay, P Pay Piggy is a legendary song. If y'all ain't heard it. Right. And I'll be honest with you. I like, I mean, the dudes that made the remix, man. I mean, those guys are like, Shout out to those dudes. That thing came out perfect. We're not even talking about the Popes. I should have just labeled this a joke stream, but that's how it is over. Everything's sort of stream of consciousness. We just have fun. No matter who, who cares. We're open to it all. I want to hear a little bit of the remix right now. Do y'all hear that? Wage cut ain't no way to be alive. Go back to nine to five. Wage cut ain't no way to be alive. Ooh. Just give me one more super chat. Hey, Piggy. Just give me one more super chance. Hey, Piggy. Just give me one more super chance. Ooh, went out with my boo. One and one makes two. Yeah, we had the baby. Ah. She, she want Gucci. On my pants on the Lambo. Volvo, no, no. A diamond grill on a baby teeth. Coolest kid in the nursery. Ah. But you know. Idealist, I flow with the transcendental argument. Reading Wittgenstein, my girl philosophically. You know what I'm saying? Just want the money. Ah. Just give me one more super chant. I remember this part. Eek, but I'm proud. Rest at a convention. To be on social media. To my subreddit. Don't make me go back to that 925. Wage cut ain't no way to be alive. Don't make me go back to 925. Wage cut. Now we just lost about 30 boomers right there. <laughs> that, that was like 
boomer kryptonite. They fled the room. Out of here. Gone, baby. They're like, I thought he was going to talk about the Vatican's. I thought he was going to talk about the papacies and the CIA's. Yep. Well, we do a lot of things over here. That's another thing that's going to mystify a lot of people. If you're new here, we do a lot of crazy stuff, man. Don't try to peg me as a one-dimensional man. I'm a 66-dimensional chess player like Don Trump and Queer Anon. If you would hit like and share. And by the way, that song is supposed to evoke super chats. <laughs> that was the whole purpose of that song. Give me one more super chance. Ooh. Come on now. Pay piggy. Uh, we do have a few super chats, so I appreciate uh, that in terms of the generous donors tonight. <clears throat> we'll be reading the super chats here in a moment, but uh, I just ended up in such a goofy mood today. Uh, if you would like to support this channel and keep it going as we get into the serious stuff, yes, we're going to get to the serious stuff. And people are like, why you do your live stream so long? Because the longer you do it, the more people donate. And also it's fun. So that's why. Uh, and I don't have to answer to you for the length of my streams. You're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me now. You're not the boss of me now. And you're not so big. So, <clears throat> we had a lot to get to yesterday that, that we didn't get to. Well, let's do that now. Now that we've wasted an hour of everybody's time just joking around. How dare you waste my time? Waste my time! It's not a waste of time if I'm exposing you to new music. Do you ever think of that? By the way, if you've not heard the hits, go listen to the hits, man. We got a bunch of hits over here, right? And why do these hits only have... 10, 11,000 views. These hits ought to have 100,000 views. Dang it. Share these hits with your friends. Now. Dang. Thank you so much there for those super chats. Much appreciated. All right. I know, I know. I keep getting distracted. It's all stream of consciousness. It's, it's random over here. It's just crazy. It's what we do. What did we not get to yesterday? Where do we start? Let's go back to the <clears throat> the CIA and the OSS relationship to the Vatican because we got up to the 20th century. Oh, I forgot something. This. <clears throat> now, as we get into the 20th century, <clears throat> the the papacy as an institution, as we said, had for a long time been, we just got like 50, 60 people just joined back. <laughs> so they waited until I was done. <laughs> it's like, it went from three, 280 concurrent viewers and it, it jumped up to like 350. So like the boomers were like, I'm going to have to walk outside and smoke a Virginia Slim and I'll come back when he's done with this bullshit. And then they came back. Welcome back to our uh, senior friends. We love you. It's just jokes. I think, too, sometimes people can't tell when I'm joking, which is most of the time. <laughs> I mean, we over here clowning all the time, and people are like, He is mean. He is mean. He's so mean-spirited. And I'm just used to being made fun of and making fun of. Did other people not go through this? Do you remember, like, when you watch stand-up comedians from the back in the day? I don't watch stand-ups anymore. I mean, we have a couple stand-ups that we're friends with, like Sam Tripoli. Ha ha Dude! Shout out to Sam Tripoli. But you would go to a stand-up thing in the 90s, right? Or even the early 2000s. And the comedians make fun of you. Duh, what do you thought? <laughs> like, people are upset that people get made fun of and jokes cut. I mean... I can't believe he jokes about the weight. That's mean. Come on, dude. Uh, where are we at? I did want to note, so important thing about <clears throat> Benedict the 15th. Dude, I can't even read these tiny letters anymore. 
So the Oxford <coughs> Oxford Dictionary of the Popes, th- this was a little nugget that I found years ago. And I can't even read this freaking page. Now I'm a boomer. That's what I get, right, for making fun of boomer jokes. Oh, wait, it's organized chronologically. That's right. Yeah, here we go. Benedict the 15th. Not Benedict the 16th, Benedict the 15th. This is a very insightful nugget. about uh, the League of Nations. And we know the League of Nations from our uh, Fabian British Empire lectures was a uh, project of the Fabians and the um, Anglo-American establishment, as Quigley himself says. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is that if you guys have heard of the famous uh, story, uh, it's a, it's popular amongst the trads, right? This story of Cardinal Rampola and the Ordo Templi Orientis, the Crowley group. So right around the turn of the century, uh, you had, I think it was the 1890s. I'm going from memory, 1890s. And you had this, this story that Cardinal Rampola was part of Crowley's OTO or, or was what was going to be the OTO or gold. I don't know, something like this, right? And there was going to be uh, an election of him as Pope at one point. And because the Austro-Hungarian emperor still had the veto status of somebody elected Pope, by the way, that proves and speaks to what we talked about in yesterday's stream, that there had for a long time been a Frankish and Germanic Cesaro papist relationship going on, kind of like you see with Borgias and the, and the Pope, the you know, nepotism and all that stuff. But here it's uh, uh, that there was still this holdover that the Austro-Hungarian emperor could veto the election of some specific papal person. He had this weird right that was granted to him and whatever papal arcana, who knows. But so the story is, according to the Trad Cats, that there was this really dangerous situation when Rampola was going to be elected pope. And it would have been really disastrous because he was... Uh, a member, he was a Crolian, right? He was a member of a, not just a Masonic sect, but a Satanic sect. Now, whatever you think of that, it's pretty clear that Rampola was uh, involved in that kind of stuff. Um, and that, you know, he's, a, was that that's a very important Cardinal in the Vatican. And this is, I bring this up because he was very close to Benedict the 15th, who would be a uh, Pope, right? Right after the turn of the century. And, Benedict the Fifteenth was a modernist and also liberal. He was soft on modernism, as is known and as is mentioned. And he was a big supporter of the League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations is this project of the Anglo-American establishment elites. And if you doubt me on that, go get your Oxford Dictionary of the Popes and look up Benedict the Fifteenth, nineteen fourteen, nineteen twenty-two. And it even mentions his connections to Cardinal Rampola. So this is J and D Kelly's. So this is a mainstream academic source verifying a lot of what had been in the domain of the the trad sphere, particularly about <clears throat> infiltration into the Vatican at the, at a very high level at the turn of the century. So now I'm not saying that Leo the Thirteenth was a uh, Satanist or anything like that because Leo is the one who ends up elected when it's not Rampola. So the Aust- if I recall, I'm going from memory. So I, again, I don't remember every arcana of trad lore from 20 years ago. So if trads want to bitch about that, go ahead. I don't care. Um, a lot of this I haven't thought about even in, even in 15 years. But because this a lot of this is coming up more recently, I've been sort of rethinking thinking about and, and re- trying to remember a lot of the, the trad lore. But uh, I guess a lot of people don't have this book, so maybe maybe I should just read it. And sh- I mean, dude, I can barely read this stuff. This is so small. Let's, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like a boomer right now. I get some giant reading. Some, I, get, I get some giant Jeffrey Dahmer glasses right now to read this stuff. So let's see about, uh, where's the League of Nations stuff? The elites. Is that what it says? There's even stuff about Lefebvre in here. That's interesting. Oh, there's actually a a whole bunch on this. Wow. Okay, so there's more on Rampola. 
Rampola was uh, Vatican Secretary of State. O- OTO member Colonel Rampola. His efforts to rally French Catholics in the Third Republic proved to be a failure. The Royalist Catholics, Catholics were outraged, and the government maintained the Concordat of 1880, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the new Secretary of State was involved in these affairs, Mariano Rampola. And then it goes on to talk about uh, his relationship with Leo XIII. Um, and this uh, mentions the veto. So listen to this. This is mainline academic sources, right? It says, Leo XIII appointed uh, him. Who's him? Pius X. The, the person that would be Pius X. Patriarch of Venice and Cardinal, and for a decade he proved to be a hard-winning pastor, absorbed in his clergy and flock, collaborating uh, discreetly with the Italian government and in local politics, advocating for an alliance of Catholics and moderate liberals against socialism. At the conclave, Leo XIII's death, Cardinal Rampola, the Secretary of State, was the first favorite. That's the OTO Crowleyan occultist. This did not prove decisive, however, for the cardinals, including Rampola, protested energetically against the intervention and uh, by Franz, Fer- Franz Joseph. Emperor Franz Joseph vetoed the election of Rampola, and this led to Leo XIII. Yes, so I remembered all that correctly. There you go. Now, Jandy Kelly doesn't mention the OTO stuff. And then it goes on to talk about Benedict the Fifteenth. And he notes that he, I've never seen anybody deal with this, by the way. I've never seen anybody talk about the support for the League of Nations from Benedict XV. This is something that I dug up in my own uh, trad arcana lore. And what this demonstrates is that this idea of the Vatican being entwined with liberal geopolitical movements and being sort of co-opted and forced into this is, is before Vatican II is the point. So... Uh, Where is the part about the League of Nations? Let's see. Let's see. Rampola comes back up. There we go. Benedict XV. From 1882 to 1887, Benedict XV was the the second secretary to Rampola, the OTO guy. Crowley and OTO guy. Diplomatic business in the papal uh, mediation between Germany and Spain on the Caroline Islands. When Rampola became Secretary of State and Cardinal in 1887, he remained with him, being under the Secretary of State, blah, 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 blah. He had hoped to become uh, Nuncio of Spain, but Pius X, who suspected him of being a disciple of Rampola. Did you hear that? Pius X, one of the last of the trad Catholic saint pope people, right? He's, He's a saint pope. Um, thought that Benedict the Fifteenth was a modernist and a disciple of Satanist Cardinal Rampola. After the war, Benedict pleaded for the international reconciliation post World War One, and although were some were critical of his of this, he gave general support to the League of Nations. He's also uh, the one that gave us, that gave you guys as the the new code of canon law that was started by, completed by Pius X. He appointed, in September, he appointed a commission to interpret. He successfully called a halt to the animosity between the traditionalists and the modernists at this time. So Benedict the Fifteenth is an overlooked agent of the in my view of the western geopolitical superstructure the wealthy families to make a truce with traditional catholicism and modernism and he helps prepare the way for vatican ii and the point of that is to just stress and and again if you don't believe me just go read this the entries on leo the 13th and benedict the 15th in J.N.D. Kelly's famous uh, history of the, of the 
the Oxford History of the Popes. Now let's see if we can find um, Cardinal Pola. Um, So here is the essay that uh, <clears throat> this was originally in one of the trad cat publications, the remnant like 20 years ago. So luckily it is archived. So I'll put the archived uh, essay in the chat for you guys. Here is <clears throat> the old uh, Catholic family news, I think. So this is from John Venari's thing. I don't remember all these trad things. I, I don't remember if that's, the remnant or Catholic family news or what, whatever it is. I don't remember all these things, but anyway, there's the, there's the full essay on Rampola himself, uh, as an almost elected Freemason. So you can read that at archive.org if you want to read that. Okay. Um, so we moved up into the 20th century and we're talking about the, the modernism, uh, and the Vatican's relationship to modernism and, Modernism really sort of being a, a not ultimately or not exclusively a spiritual problem, but also something part of a geopolitical tool. And that's why Benedict XV support of the, of the League of Nations, which is the, the global elite's creation after World War I for global government, according to them. Right? Quigley, right there. We've lectured through that whole 1,300-page book. World War II leads to the United Nations, which is the repeat of the same process, right? And Quigley says that World War I and World War II and the Cold War were the uh, wars of this same elite to bring about global governance. Now, when we come back to the lecture uh, or the interview from Paul Williams, we'll pick back up around where uh, we were listening. I'm going to summarize a little bit because we don't want to listen to all of this. Uh, we're not, we don't have time to listen to the whole thing, but I'm going to skip ahead to the parts in Paul Williams' interview, which is based on his book, Gladio. And this is really crucial to understand, again, from a guy who, he's, he's a Catholic professor, Catholic scholar. This is not a Orthodox conspiracy theorist. Just like... David Wim Hof, traditional Catholic lawyer and scholar who wrote the John Courtney Murray book. And these books go into a lot of depth, They're just like Michael Hoffman, Roman Catholic traditionalist of some flavor who wrote the occult Renaissance book. So all of these critiques are coming out of the, the traditional Catholic world. Right. So it's not like I got all this from just, oh, I made all this up from some. That's why a lot of trads, you know, have kind of been more willing to chat recently is because it's like, yeah, I, I'm I'm going from you guys as sources. Right. And just to, I'll give you a sampling of some of the trad books I read back in the trad days. And I got, again, a whole shelves of trad books. So, yeah. So I read when I was in the SSBX. Here's proof. This doesn't prove I was in the, uh, part of the SSPX, but it's proof that, right, I read Michael Davies. This is Angelus Press, as you can see, all of Volume 2. Michael Davies, New Mass, all of Volume 3. I can't find Volume 1. I don't know if I lost it or gave it away. Another one of the classics, Thomas Tom Woods, Christopher Ferrar, Ferrara. Remember this? The Great Facade, right? So I put years and years and years into Tradcat books, Tradcat works. And guess what? I even read the libs. I even read Xavier Wren. I'm sorry, that's not Xavier Wren. That's Olden Hatch, Life of John the 23rd. I went into the libs Xavier Wren on Vatican II. Um, I read Paul Blanchard's whole book on Vatican II. And I'm showing you guys this to, to, to demonstrate that, like, I know what I'm talking about, right? And I don't even care that much about Vatican II and all this stuff anymore. So it's not like I'm trying to be, oh, I want to be the authority on Vatican II. I don't care about Vatican II and being any, any authority on Vatican II. But my point is that what happens in the trad world, and I'm going to give credit to the trads here. This isn't the giving credit to the trad stream. We'll do that separate. And I'm trying to get Timothy Gordon to come on if he wants to. So to give credit to the trads, <clears throat> one of the things that, when I got into all the trad literature back in my, in my twenties in the, in the early two thousands, 
was that they started noticing the geopolitical connections. So my, my personal track into getting from pure theology into the geopolitics was from all the trads. And especially books like Michael Davies books on all the various influences on Vatican II and the new mass, right? If you get into the Davies works, the trilogy, which I've read, you start to realize that there's all of these external influences. And I don't just mean Protestantism. I mean, intelligence agency influences. CIOSS is what I'm talking about. And then when you read Tom Woods and when you read Ferrara and these kind of classic trad texts, right? These books are not primarily about the geopolitical. I'm saying that they start to, to talk about that. They're, people are noticing this, these other influences at, at the, <clears throat> especially at Vatican too. And to a lot of young guys out there that haven't gotten into geopolitics, they don't know the history of this kind of stuff. Like they don't care about that. They're not interested in that. And that's fine. You don't have to be. I'm not telling you, you have to be interested in this, but what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is that when you read, you know, like mainline histories or background studies of people's lives, like John Paul II or uh, John the 23rd, you will find even the mainstream books going into the intertwined geopolitical and intelligence agency connections that these people have. And so what happened in my life was that in my 20s, I kind of just kind of quit caring about the Vatican II trad stuff, right? I eventually just wasn't interested in that anymore because I realized that there was a lot of forces involved in Vatican II as an example and the papacy as well in the 20th century, 19th century that, that extended far beyond mere theological minutia debates Right. We get into power plays, power blocks, geopolitics, the Anglo-American establishment and their interest in influencing, co-opting and controlling the Vatican by their own admissions. And that's why Paul Williams's book is so great is because as a Catholic professor, he went and documented this. He documented the CIA OSS using the Vatican Bank as an organized crime money laundering system. And not only that, bugging the Vatican, co-opting and blackmailing people in the Vatican. And he got a lot of heat and flack over that book. And as I was reading, you know, just kind of like standard books about <clears throat> like the life of John the 23rd, you know, there's whole chapters on his intellectual journey, his own personal beliefs. And particularly if you have this Alden Hatch life of John the 23rd, um, chapter eight, chapter eight is all about, and this is not a, like a hit piece book. It's all about his liberalism, his ideas of internationalism, Angelo Roncalli, his ideas of indifferentism, his ideas of being one of the first and I've never found this anywhere else, but in, I think, I think it's in this Alden Hatch. I'm going to look and see biography of John the 23rd. For example, in the, I think it's still chapter eight, the church and the liberators supporting communists, socialists, and worker priests. Now I'm not into the, uh, the dialectic of cold war stuff. I think that it's, it was all kind of a trick. But a lot of these friends are sort of BFF and amenable to socialism and particularly Fabianism. For example, on page 133, John XXIII became an adamant supporter of the United Nations, especially its UNESCO organization. Now, who in their right mind could read Julian Huxley's philosophy of UNESCO and support that? The philosophy of UNESCO is a eugenics-based, dysgenics-based, depop, abrasion-promoting document. And we've lectured through that whole document. So how on earth can John the 23rd praise this organization? Which is fundamentally a satanic organization. And this led a lot of trads to investigate and get into the ideas that John the 23rd was part of a Masonic lodge. He was into Rosicrucianism. That may be the case. All right. So I know the main source for that is a couple traditional Catholic books that are out of print. They're very hard to get. 
Um, maybe. I don't know either way. But from my vantage point, I don't really need to know. It would be it would be nice to know. But do we really need to know if he was part of some lodge? If he's publicly promoting, accepting, uh, uh, praising these kinds of organizations and institutions. Another one of the amazing things that I noticed in the Alden Hatch biography that I've never seen anywhere else. Let me, let me see if this is it. I think this is it. Was the actions of inviting. Yeah, this is it. So John the 23rd was actually doing Assisi type gatherings. Everybody's familiar with the Assisi gatherings, right? If you don't know about this, let's see if we can find that. This is, you know, something that we, we need to know about. This is uh, John Paul II famously had this uh, gathering where they, whoa, somebody up... 18 hours. Is that the whole thing? The interfaith gatherings at Assisi. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to play all these videos, but this is the infamous uh, incident where they, uh, here's a short video. Let's see if we can play something short. I don't want to play these 20 hour videos. Let's see if this works. Chewy, you can save on all the gifts you need for the gifts that you you know, they famously had uh, the altar uh, covered up with, they covered up the, the crucifix, put cloths over it, and they let voodoo practitioners come into the church and, and do their ceremonies. And this is more uh, damning than the kissing the Quran incident, right? Everybody knows about the kissing the Quran incident. This is even more damning than that, though. Um. So this is at the beginning of a CZ. I'm just going to give you the the breakdown of it. Here come the Muslims. Here come the Armenians. Here come the so-called Orthodox Anglicans. So they're all together with the Buddhists, and they're all praying uh, to their common deity. And they've got a I don't know what that is. Or he's reading something. Later on, he's holding like a, a plant or some sort of symbolic tree or plant. There's the Native Americans. And yes, they did the, the pagan ceremonies. Uh, here you can see uh, some of the, uh, I think these are the Jainists. These are either Buddhists or Jainists doing their worship in the church, in the cathedral church of St. Francis of Assisi. So this, they're in the church doing this stuff. You understand? And I mean, it's essentially pagan worship in the church. all with the approval of the papacy and with other heterodox clerics. I'm absolutely uh, happy to say that Bartholomew, it wasn't Bartholomew, if I don't remember who the, who the, who the patriarch was in the 80s, but uh, Native American uh, pagan services going on together with so-called Catholics. Zoroastrian prayer service everybody together praying you can't do this okay this is in the ancient canons this is forbidden this is an excommunicatable offense other religions judaism islam and they're all praying together in unison as if they all have the same faith and believe in the same god of course if you're orthodox you know that this is not the case this is another reason we critique natural theology because the basis for this is the the Western view of natural theology that everybody's worshiping a generic Unitarian God. And then later on down the road, uh, we'll tack on Trinity. This is, this is not our view. And they're here. They're all holding the plants. Like I told you, like holding their, uh, whatever the heck they've got their little potted plants. So it's kind of like earth worship themes. I mean, it's all just ridiculous, right? There's the Dalai Lama, right? <laughs> the Dalai Lama is right there next to whoever that, Probably bishop, probably patriarch of Constantinople, I would guess. Um, so there you go. That's the spirit of Assisi. But the reason I bring this up is, well, I mean, we may have some people that are not familiar with this. But the, that a lot of people think, oh, that was like the, a revolutionary thing. No, actually, John the 23rd was doing an Assisi type thing before Assisi. 
and this is covered in the Olden Hatch book. This is chapter 14 called A Great Enterprise. It says... trying to find exactly where he, he had this prayer meeting where he invited, I think a bunch of Protestants to the Vatican for a prayer meeting. And this was the first that I found of this. There's no limit to the efforts that John went to exert personally reconciliation of Christians to the universal church. In fact, he was anxious to establish relationships with every religion and had already tried to change the liturgy that had offensive terminology that offended the Jews. One of his first papal acts was to receive the Shah of Iran. In less than a month after his coronation, the young Mohammedan ruler had asked to be received by the Pope, the crown. The crowd in St. Peter's gave him a shout of welcome and blah, blah, blah. That's not a big deal. I mean, the, it's receiving people as the head of, uh, head of state. But then it says, this is not the first time that the Roman crowd had cheered Muslim rulers. When another Shah visited Rome, a time of intense Italian anti-clericalism, they, they shouted, long live the Shah, down with the Pope. John is said to have remarked to the Shah, I'm glad that this time they are smiling to cheer both of us. And then it says, John Paul, Pope John XXIII gave a benediction in which he rephrased delicately, delicately anything that would offend Muslims. He wrote, may the abundance of the favor of the Almighty of God be with you, Muslims. That's page... 225 and then it goes on to talk about now again i'm not saying that he's bad because he received people as heads of state and all that that's not the point the point is that he does this uh, prayer meeting which i'm going to get to here in a minute where he first invites protestants which i think is the first time that there have ever been anything like this uh oh i forgot that and he also writes pacham and Terras, which is the famous encyclical that deals with economics at a global level. And John the 23rd basically kind of makes a Fabian socialist type, type of uh, uh, argument throughout this famous encyclical. But he also argues for freedom of worship, freedom of conscience, the Vatican II doctrines. And it was called at this time extremely progressive and a movement towards world government by most of its critics. That's Pacham and Terras, the famous encyclical of John the 23rd. John also then uh, was publicly known for <clears throat> John the 23rd proposed in his uh, encyclical a public world authority to have world government powers set up by common accord and not <clears throat> uh, opposed by force, but however to promote the United Nations common good. Men of goodwill in every country and all religion praised this document and called it revolutionary. So John the 23rd uh, begins this process of calling for world government on the part of the Vatican. And this is the real shift away from what we had seen um, even as late as 1928. So you remember in 1928, you had Pius XI writing his encyclical uh, Mortalium Animos, which says that all forms of interfaith worship and gathering are apostasy. So from 1928 to the time of John the 23rd in the 1950s and 60s, I forget, I forget exactly what year he's uh, chosen as Pope. You have a complete change, complete night and day, right? And But I'm just stressing that Uh, the Protestants who were then eventually invited to the Vatican for prayer services under John the 23rd for the first time. One of the uh, Congregationalist ministers, George H. Williams, put it succinctly, Pope John the 23rd is not setting himself up as someone else above us. He is actually one with us. So he's one with the Protestants according to the Protestant tradition or to, to this Protestant theologian. Methodist theologians present for this, Dr. Kusak. We like John the 23rd because he is just like one of us, Protestants. Something must come of this sooner or later. Hopefully, 
a world religion or excuse me, a world government that's able to be fair. So that this was all promoted about, you know, like fairness and a fair world religion or something. I wanted to find the exact chapter on this meeting though, where he invites people to Protestants to a prayer prayer services at the Vatican for the first time. Now, people be here people are who who might hear this and, and be freaking out. You can't participate in the religious public worship services of other religions. And that's something that traditional Catholics held to all the way up until at least 1928 publicly in Mortalium Animos. And it's something that orthodoxy traditionally also holds to. It's part of canon law going back to the first seven canon or first seven councils and the canons that excommunicate clerics for attending the services of other religions. And yes, these are other religions. So why did we have to bring up John the 23rd? Well, because of his famous encyclical Pachim and Teres, promoting the United Nations, promoting UNESCO, promoting religious freedom, promoting indifferentism, promoting socialism, Fabianism, worker priests who were known communists and socialists, which the Vatican had previously not supported openly. And... Let's see. And let me see that. Oh, I think this is it. Let's see if this is it. I thought it was funny that uh, it's, he notes that much of the Catholic hierarchy, when John uh, announced that he he was going to have a new ecumenical council, Vatican II, is as much of the hierarchy were, were appalled. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's telling. Anyway, I thought for sure that I know there's a section about Baptists. Maybe it's the part at the end about uh, Williams, Minister William, Congregation Theologian George Williams. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. The Pope and the Protestants. Okay, that's chapter. That's it. Chapter 16. So this is a mainline, you know, biography of John the 23rd. It's not a conspiracy text. Okay, it's not a a book trying to prove he's some kind of apostate. Um, let's see if there's anything else in Xavier Wren's book. Now, if I recall, Xavier Wren was at Vatican II and he was a liberal. Um, so, and by the way, uh, if you read Paul Blanchard's book on Vatican II, what the heck? I don't know what that is. People trying to call sitting there the internet. God, the internet calling you. That ain't the internet. The internet don't call me. That's a dang freaking robocall or a scammer. This is the internet. This is the internet calling you from Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah, the internet don't call from Las Vegas, Nevada. Anywhere. This is getting boring and dumb. So you get the point, right, guys? Hopefully. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if that book's out of print, but the great thing about having all these old books is that you got these nuggets, right? These pieces of gold. It was. It was like some... It was some... Not a robocall. What do you call it? What's the word for the telemarketer? This is the internet calling from... <laughs> calling from Las Vegas. Would you like to buy some things? Nah, but I'm ready to gamble, dog. You over there in Las Vegas. Now my internet's going to cut out because I, I hung up on that dude. Uh, okay, so back to the uh, 20th century Vatican that we talked about. Now, so what <clears throat> What led to this co-opting and um, collusion compromise in the Vatican? Now, a lot of people think, oh, it's the liberalism, it's the ideology. That played a role. But I'm trying to tell you guys that if you don't get the geopolitical side of this, 
None of this is going to ultimately, this is a huge puzzle piece for understanding all this. A lot of this isn't going to make sense. And there's key books that are, that have come out recently that totally help explain this and may, oh, now it makes sense. Now we know. Again, two of these key books are these two by Catholics. I don't know how trad Paul Williams is, but he is a Catholic professor of some kind. And then David Wimhoff, who is a traditional Catholic in his gigantic classic must read book, John Courtney Murray, Time Life Magazine and the American Proposition. How the CIA's doctrinal warfare program changed the Catholic Church. These are absolutely essential, indispensable books for understanding what's what else is going on with Vatican II. It's not just theology. I know a lot of Spurgs, a lot of people out there that don't know anything about geopolitics think that the Vatican is just sit, sitting up there debating theology all day. Well, I got news for you. That's not what they're doing. They're meeting with heads of state. They're meeting with the CIA heads, etc., in fact, all throughout the Cold War, John Paul II consistently met with William Colby. Now, how do I know that? Because it's in Gordon Thomas's book about the history of the Mossad. Gordon Thomas is just a geopolitical analyst. And he, does, he analyzes all kinds of things, right? And so the chapter on... Ali Agka and the assassination of John Paul II is very important if you want to understand some of this. Here's the chapter. It's called Blessed Are the Spy Masters. See that? Blessed Are the Spy Masters. And what does he say in this chapter? Well, this chapter gets into the deep relationship and what might have been the motivations of the uh, attack by Ali Agka on. John Paul II. So we're not talking about the assassinates of John Paul I. We're talking about uh, the guy that, if you, if you don't know, that shot John Paul II, right? <clears throat> Gordon Thomas notes that John Paul II was perhaps the most geopolitical of all of the modern popes. And I think people that know about we know why. Because this is the Cold War. This is the winding down of the Cold War. And I think everybody can tell and knows which side John Paul II was on. Now, some of the trads are like, well, I kind of think that maybe he uh, he wasn't really that anti-communist. So the trads think he's kind of like a, a secret communist. But I think the people, and I want to give credit to the trads because they're on to the right trail here. You guys are going in the right direction. But where it's not, to use the often for, <laughs> the off-used internet phrase, not nuanced enough, got to be more nuanced because this is not primarily the God-believing West versus the atheist East. Okay, that's a dialectic. And we know this because more and more information has been coming out, especially in the last 20 years, of a lot of historians, a lot of intelligent uh, writers, analysts, a lot of books from the establishment that have come to a lot of people's attention that was kind of locked away in the in the the dusty tomes of ancient of, of archives and libraries I'm talking about tragedy and hope I'm talking about these kinds of books. We find more and more people at a higher level above the East West dialectic who want this to lead to something of a synthesis. The third way, the Fabians. That's why the Fabian stuff is so key to understand. So is John Paul II a communist? No. Is John Paul II a capitalist? No. Is he a Fabian? Perhaps. But none of that matters because this was all ultimately a long-term plan that the Anglo-American establishment elites had to get the Vatican to support Americanism. That's it. It's that simple. That's why Vatican II has religious liberty. Americanism. That is the whole thesis of this 800-page book. Is it 800? No, 950 pages. Thousand plus footnotes, 950 pages. That's the point of that book. Now, people scoffed and mocked at, at the Wim Hof text as if this was some sort of kooky fringe thing. Uh, he's been on your own channels. He's been on Flanders and other Tradcat channels. I don't know if he was on Taylor Marshall's or not. I don't know. But 
He goes on your own channel. He's, he was on Kelly uh, Tim's podcast. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, if you're in the Lofton, you know, normie Novus Ordo sphere and you want to scoff at the geopolitics like they do, uh, which they don't know anything about this stuff, right? Then you can scoff at that all you want, but you're just showing your own ign ignorance. Anyway, so... <clears throat> The reason that the Spy Master chapter in uh, the Gordon Thomas book is relevant is, let me read you this. Let's see this. <clears throat> Nahum Admoni began to explore the CIA's current involvement with the papacy, particularly with uh, William Casey's regular visit. I said Colby, I meant Casey. Uh, no, but now William Colby matters too, because William Colby is a trad cat who was head of the CIA. And that was all during, uh, he's, He's involved in the beginning of Gladio because he was stationed in Italy. We're going to get that in a minute. But uh, then he, I'm going to have to, I'm going to go forward to John Paul. And I'm going to skip back to Gladio because that's going to help set the stage for how we got to where we are with John Paul and his relationship with William Casey and so forth. And then we're going to step back and we'll, and we'll understand that the that Gladio is the key to, to understanding this. Gladio then is what also helps to prep for the special relationship with the Jesuits, namely John Courtney Murray and the CIA. And the reason this matters is because, again, it's not just religious things promoting and prompting the passing of Vatican II. It's geopolitical stuff, the doctrinal warfare program, C.D. Jackson. So if you don't know about those things, then you don't, you're not in a position to, to, to sneer and mock and laugh at that because this is public historical information and you're just showing your own ignorance when you sneer and mock at this stuff <clears throat> between William Casey's regular visits to the Pope and his <clears throat> important player in the relationship between the Vatican and the CIA it was John Cardinal Kroll of Philadelphia who was the liaison shuttling this meeting the meetings between the White House and the Apostolic Palace Monsignor John McGee the Pope's English language speaking secretary and Cardinal Kroll were the Holy Father's extra special pals. Both came from similar backgrounds, blah, blah, blah. It had been Cardinal Kroll who had accepted William Casey to the CIA directorship first, first audience meeting with John Paul II after his convalescence. Later, the Cardinal introduced William Casey's deputy Vernon Walters to the pontiff. Since then, the list of subjects the CIA officer and the Pope discussed ranged from terrorism, the Middle East, internal politics of the church, the health of Kremlin leaders, etc., etc. For author Richard Allen, a Catholic who was Ronald Reagan's first national security advisor, and he's the one that wrote, I think, uh, The Life of Ratzinger, right? The same Allen. So a lot of these neocon cat, uh, Cold Warrior Catholics are buddy-buddy with Reagan and John Paul II, and they're also part of CIA. Uh, I think the Weigel guy, I'm just going from memory, like that wrote the big giant biography of John Paul II. I think he's one of these uh, sort of neocon Cold Warrior characters. <clears throat> the relationship between the CIA and the Pope was one of the great alliances, greatest alliances of all time. Reagan had a deep uh, conviction that the Pope would help him to change the world and to end the Cold War. More certain common goals were established. The president and the pontiff had proclaimed that they stood in opposition to abortion. That's a good thing. Although, does it really make sense to support UNESCO, a organization founded to promote abortion? But which the papacy had done for many years, that doesn't make sense to me. But maybe there's double uh, speak involved. The United Station. The United States blocked millions of dollars of aid to countries that ran family planning pro programs, although the Pope publicly says he likes UNESCO. Uh, the Pope, through his purposeful silence, supported all of the U.S. military policies, including support for NATO. By the way, it's not just silence. So you'll notice that Gordon Thomas's analysis was that uh, the, uh, the Reagan NATO operations um, that the Pope was silent about he wasn't just silent about them. In fact, we're going to see that the papacy and the Vatican Bank played a key role. If you spe especially if you look into the character of uh, Archbishop uh, Marcinkus in being the the uh, another one of the BCCI type banks that funneled this kind of money and had uh, organized crime and cocaine money all being uh, the Pope got a cut of all this, according to to 
according to Catholics, not me. And notice Gordon Thomas is going to back up one of the claims of Paul Williams. John Paul thus was silent on the operations of NATO and the U.S. military due to this special relationship, including supplies that NATO sent to uh, uh, NATO supplying cruise missiles. The CIA regularly bugged the phones of bishops and priests throughout Central America and the Vatican, according to Williams. Part of this was about the advancement of liberation theology and the uh, and any priests or bishops who opposed death squads and U.S. backed forces in Nicaragua and El Salvador. The phone transcripts form part of the Pope's Friday briefing for the uh, Rome CIA station chiefs. And then uh, lastly, uh, this is this also brings in uh, Alexander Haig, Oliver North, Colonel Oliver, Oliver North, uh, who were funneling the BCCI, the drug money, and whatnot, to support the Contras and all that. So uh, he mentions that, which is all well known. I don't think we have to go into that. Surely everybody knows about that stuff. Although I'm sure that a lot of young guys probably don't know about that. All right, so we can understand the the clear uh, relationship between John Paul II. Uh, President Reagan and the CIA under the auspices of the Cold War. Now, I want to be be fair. So I'm not saying that the entire institution of the Roman Catholic Church was evil and bad and all the people and all the bishops were corrupt. That's not the point. The point is that from the vantage point of geopolitical power, as has always been the case on the part of the state, this has happened in the Orthodox world as too, uh, in, in the history of the church too, especially the iconoclasm councils and the, the emperors that were iconoclasts, they wanted to turn the church iconoclast for geopolitical purposes. It wasn't just theology. Okay, not everybody's a theology spurred, guys. And I know a lot of theology nerds out there can't fathom that. But for a lot of the people involved in being billionaires and running banks, they don't care anything about theology. They don't they could care less about the filioque, about any of that. They care about these institutions as tools, as soft power, as potential NGOs. The CIA's program of doctrinal warfare was to recruit all the churches in America, Protestant as well, Orthodox as well, to be a part of this soft power extension of Americanism. So Vatican II was amenable to the Americanist project, particularly the Four Freedoms, particularly Woodrow Wilson, FDR, all of those projects of Americanism. are part and parcel with religious liberty, religious freedom, because that's part and parcel with economic liberalism, neoliberalism. You see they go together. It's the thesis of Wim Hof. And because it wasn't really Reagan that was running these things, if you remember uh, when Reagan stepped out of line, what happened to Ronald Reagan? Oh, he gets a bullet in his arm or whatever, right? Why was that? Because Ronald Reagan started talking about the Trilateral Commission and the CFR. And you're going to listen to what Paul Williams says about that. Trilateral Commission and CFR. That's who is running these things and running the shutting down of the Cold War, according to Malachi Martin in his gigantic treatise. The Malta meeting, the ending of the Cold War on a geopolitical level, not just the, the the wall falling as a symbolic action, right? Now, there's a special meeting arranged by George Bush Sr., John Paul II, and Gorbachev, right? And this is covered at length in this propaganda book, Keys of This Blood, which is, I mean, Malachi Martin is basically just doing the CIA line. That's it. That's what this book is. But this book is useful, even though it's propaganda, because it goes along very well with tragedy and hope, right? So in my view, Malachi Martin is not a real trad cat. Malachi Martin was a CIA operative, and I think it's very easy to deduce that. And I think Wim Hof even might even think that. I can't remember for sure. But uh, so what am I talking about? Well, we need to know about this because this is important for this winding down of the Cold War. Let's see if we can find anything on um, the Malta meeting. 
Yes, that's it, 1989. So you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, this is it. Gorbachev, Bush summit. Now it's also John Paul II. So I don't know why they don't have that there, but let's see if this talks about it. Here, like throughout the world, there is heightened interest in the Soviet Union to everything new that is happening in that country. New political thinking, perestroika, glasnost are words known by one and all today. The prestige and popularity of the Soviet leader is high here, whose name is connected with radical changes in the USSR and the establishment of a new climate in international relations. The people of Malta, well under Malta is a giant CIA hub, if you didn't know this, by the way. I mean, it should be obvious, but if you don't know any of this stuff, that's that's who that's what's going on here. Understand the importance of this meeting for the fate of the world and Europe. Mikhail Gorbachev and Prime Minister Edward Fenech Adami at their meeting discussed the need to deepen the all-European dialogue to intensify constructive efforts to resolve the problems of the Mediterranean. Did you know that that um, thing on Gorbachev's head, it actually is grape flavored? I'm not joking. A lot of people thought this, that it was like a, like a grape flavored birthmark, but you can actually, uh, if you go to certain museums that house his body, uh, you can actually, there's some place where you can lick that and it literally tastes like grape. Trying to find John. So John Paul II is at this meeting and so that there's Bush. See, so this was Bush senior arranged this, by the way, Bush senior used to be CIA director, uh, uh, uh suspiciously or right around right before JFK is, uh, taken care of. Events are developing. An in-depth discussion is to be held on a wide ranging package of the most important issues of today, not limited by an earlier adopted agenda. Oh, here it is. Here we go. Well, the of Mr. Gorbachev's visit to Italy without question was his visit to the Pope. The first time ever that the leader of... No, that's not it. Anyway, John Paul II is at this, this meeting. Bush Summit, Malta. And all right. Because there's a whole chapter on it. I don't know why that video doesn't mention John Paul II, but uh, there's a whole chapter on it at the end of this book, right? Which we, uh, by the way, we've lectured through this whole book. And by the way, there's a whole chapter on Cardinal Rampola and all the stuff I told you about. So this is not, it's not me making this. Oh, this is all just classic trad cat lore. <laughs> so none of this stuff is anything I made up. Um, I did want to find that the Malta meeting though. Let's see. And, and if you do want a fuller treatment of my analysis of this seven, uh, 800 page book, we've lectured through this, the totality of this book. Uh, let's see Malta. Where's that up? Malta Summit, 449. John Paul II, here we go. Uh, no. And the, 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 the reason Gorbachev is really important is that Gorbachev is one of these figures who is, um, he is a synthesis figure. I hope you guys understand this, right? So I think a lot of people who don't know much about the Cold War, like, the, oh, Gorby's the, uh, the socialist who's trying to infiltrate and destroy the West. No, no. Do you understand that from the KGB Russian standpoint, they didn't like Gorbachev. In fact, there was a coup to try to get rid of Gorbachev precisely because from their vantage point, Gorbachev was uh, compromising the Soviet Union and basically collapsing it to the West. So that's a very important thing to understand. Does that mean that Gorbachev wasn't a socialist? No, he was, but he was a socialist who wanted this new world order. And this is not, this is a propaganda book. Okay. I'm not saying that Malachi Martin is a stand up figure. He's not. 
But this book is very relevant to all the stuff that we're talking about. Okay, here's the Malta meeting with Bush. Yeah. Bush Sr., Gorbachev, and Malta. Let me see what he... Let me, here's what he says at the end of this book. He says, at this chapter, he says... In the official mind of the West, it was uh, the arrival of George Bush Sr. The United States worshipped the Belknap to the Maltese coast where he was scheduled to meet the summit with Gorbachev. On the eve of the Vatican summit, the wryly humorous Soviet spokesman Gerasimov said they had been fighting for years about a dialogue between Christians and Marxists. This time it will be real. This is a time of a conceptual talk. The conceptual talk here meant down to earth and practical. In other words, not about theological passions and religion anymore. Vatican summit, 1989, Bush senior, Gorbachev and Malta. December 12th, 1989. Oh, oh I didn't realize was a whole, there actually is a whole chapter on it. So here's the whole chapter on it. I thought that was a, uh, just a section, but it's, it's an entire chapter. So, um, I think he talks about, he might go into, uh, actually there's a whole bunch about Malta and all that in this chapter. So anyway, <clears throat> I mean, Although this book is completely like Cold War propaganda, what's what's really amazing about this book is that just the book's existence itself. Do you, do you see the subtitle of the book? John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of what? The New World Order. No, this book is a dubious book in the sense of what he's actually arguing because he's arguing that the communists are trying to destroy the Vatican. The communists are the problem. And he's the book is about the CIA being the good guys. Right? And then ultimately, he's got this argument that John Paul II is doing 66-dimensional chess. I'm not joking. To secretly take control of the new world order and make it Catholic. <laughs> but the most absurd part of the book is that at the end, he's like, but John Paul is surrounded by evil people. So he can't be the trad that he wants to be. So yeah, he's got a lot of liberal modernist stuff that he's doing, but he's playing a longer game. Oh, come on. You're ridiculous. By the way, give me, give me, give me a, a break. Um, Malachi Martin goes on in that book to uh, predict set of occultism. Now, there might have been a couple set of occultists in the world at that time, because this book came out a long time ago. Um, but there's an appendix in this book, and you'll, you guys know that we uh, we covered set of occultism in terms of its geopolitical elements in several videos over the years, but more recently we covered this because the uh, one of the first set of occultist bishops whose succession is what matters to a lot of those people is Archbishop Tuke, uh, and when we read the Valentine book, when we did the analysis of that, we found out that uh, Tuke worked with the CIA in, in Vietnam. Ooh, interesting. So how is it that uh, Malachi Martin, another uh, open pro CIA Western operative guy here, how is it that in the early 90s, this book came out in 1990? 1990? There's an appendix in this book where he predicts set of a contism as a rising force. It's the same page where he talks about Cardinal Rampola being in the OTO. Cause so he talks about that too. Well, he talks about him being in the, in the uh, sec a secret lodge of the Freemasons. And keep that in mind because although Freemasonry is not the main point of what we're talking about tonight, in regard to Italian politics, it's going to matter because that's what the P2 Lodge is. P2 Lodge is high level NASI and fascist Freemason occultists in Italy who are also organized crime figures. I'm not joking. And this is this is public, well known. I just played yesterday the mainstream news clips from the 1980s about the P2 Lodge. Now he says about 
So Malachi Martin repeats the whole. Cardinal Rampola story that I mentioned and shared to you guys about Franz Joseph uh, having the veto of the whoever got elected Pope. That's all right here. It's on page 676, 678. See, uh, this is the chapter Triple Weakness right there. Okay, so <clears throat> it was only in subsequent years that the true motive for Franz Joseph's vetoing was revealed. The emperor was privy to a very close held secret that Cardinal Rampola had, jo had joined a secret lodge of Freemasons, a lodge of secret free Freemasons. And if you read uh, the article from Catholic Family News, it's not just Freemasons, it's uh, Crowley stuff, which is even worse, right? So, again, there's that. Now, by the way, Malachi Martin was involved in uh, Vatican II. Uh, I think he was a peritus uh, attached to Cardinal Bay. So, Malachi Martin had a really close relationship to Cardinal Bay, who was the right, right-hand right man of Paul VI. So, keep that in mind, because in the Paul Williams interview, he talks about how Paul VI was a very close collaborator with the OSS. Again, all of this stuff is, like, right in mainstream Catholic sources. And the point of this is not to say that everybody who was co-opted to working with Western intelligence is therefore a bad guy. Okay, I'm not saying that because I understand that in the time of the Cold War, that made us that made sense to a lot of people. And people were really worried about, you know, Soviet atheism, global, you know, nuclear war or whatever. But the problem is that as Wim Hof notes, number one, this was extremely exaggerated. And it was not the the, the main issue was that they wanted there to be a Cold War for a longer end game. And that's what a lot of people have a hard time with. They can't figure this out. But the, but the way that we know this is because of many of the people at a very high, powerful, wealthy level who were monopoly capitalists for over a century want there to be a blending, a third position, a synthesis, which is what the Council on Foreign Relations exists to be. It is the, in, the engine of that, as well as the trilaterals to bring about the synthesis. That's their own charter to end American sovereignty to bring about a world order. And all of these trad cat authors that I've been talking about, they are aware of that for the most part. Not Malachi Martin because he's just giving you the Cold War CIA line, but it's relevant to read his, uh, his book because it shows the propaganda that they were trying to put out. So let's listen to some more of what Paul Williams says, and you're going to notice that Gladio is the key puzzle piece for understanding how the Vatican Bank was brought into this giant money laundering operation. Now, we played a lot of this uh, yesterday. We're not going to play this whole interview, but there's some really key details in the second half of this. He goes on to talk about... So, <clears throat> Gladio was the mastermind of James Jesus Angleton and Ellen Dulles. They were also, uh, now Dulles was famous because he did want to use a lot of the uh, fascists that were, that were holdovers as these stay behind units. There were hundreds of stay behind units and throughout the, uh, the succeeding decades um, between Alan Dulles and James Jesus Angleton, they uh, were able to train hundreds of units with 20 to 50 soldiers, sleeper cells, stay behind units who were engaged in thousands, excuse me, not thousands, 1500 fake flag operations according to Catholic author Paul Williams. <clears throat> the OSS <clears throat> needed money uh, for a lot of these operations, and so <clears throat> this is where they were uh, allied with organized crime figures, particularly Lucky Luciano, Don Callo, Vito Genovese, Santos Traficante, and the main figure here is Lucky Luciano. This is why, as you heard me cover in my Mafia lectures, there was uh, the usage of the Sicilian Mafia to bring in heroin. Heroin is the third most valuable asset market in the world. 
So the heroin trade, the opium trade, uh, the drug trade, uh, the crack and cocaine trade as well is all connected to these banks on an international level. And all of that has come out in mainstream news in the last 10 years. So why is it this way? Well, <clears throat> for black operations, you can't typically go to the uh, to Congress to ask for money. Congress, will you give us money for black operations and uh, fake flag operations? No. Oh, okay, thank you. We'll do that with black markets and black market funding. And everybody knows this. This is like not even hidden anymore. It's all famous stuff. <laughs> This is because you need liquid cash for these kinds of under-the-table operations. Thus, the perfect organizations to uh, fulfill this role would be organized crime and the mafia. And the way this worked was they would get a cut, and then the CIA and the deep state would get a cut. There you go. Heroin, as we said, is the third most valuable asset in the world. And so by 1947, the focus of this trafficking uh, became Italy. That's what you've heard me uh, talk about in the mob lectures. That's also mainline organized crime history. Selwyn Rob's book talks about this. I need my sipping jug. Pius XII, uh, at this time, <clears throat> was worried about the popularity of communism in Italy. Now, I am not pro-communist. Communism is terrible. And the whole point of the lectures that we've been doing recently are about Fabian socialism, which is communism, socialism allied to capitalism. It's a version of the third way synthesis. I think these are all bad. Okay. So if you're listening to this, he's a socialist, he's a commie. No, I'm not. <laughs> what are you talking about? We're up here lecturing against socialism, communism all the time. Oh, then you're a capitalist, uh, Protestant, work ethic. No, I'm not. I don't like that either. But Pius XII was worried about communism and the overthrow of uh, the papacy and its influence that was already waning in Italy. And so he has a meeting with James Jesus Angleton and uh, uh, Bill Donovan. <clears throat> William Colby was also stationed in Italy at this time, uh, uh, as uh, an important uh, CIA asset, although Colby is not director yet. So Colby is not the director yet, but this is where he s appears to have been ha involved in some way, probably with the early stages of Gladio. This is hinted at in the William Colby documentary. It doesn't say it explicitly, but it seems pretty clear to me that he was there involved in that. I thought I still had that documentary up. Maybe I, don't, maybe I took it. It's not up here in public. Anyway, man who knew too much, right? That's a great documentary. Go watch that. It, it'll talk about a lot of what I'm talking about. Anyway, so uh, the the West, CIA, and the Vatican wanted to support the Christian Democratic Party. And uh, $42 million initially at this time is laundered through the Vatican Bank to support and prop up the Christian Democratic Party, which will support the papacy against the communists. Now, I don't fault the Vatican or the West for wanting to not have communists running things. The problem is that if you're going to use a bunch of drug money, <laughs> that's the problem. Okay. At this time, $20 million would personally go into the, the Pope's personal coffers by 1950. Thus, the Vatican CI link was solidified from this time period on, from the nineteen from nineteen forty seven to nineteen fifty, in regard to the Italian elections. And this is actually mentioned in the, the Colby documentary. So Colby is there involved in this for sure. But you got to read the Williams book to get like the real details as to, and he's gone into the declassified documents. So he's not just theorizing. This is based on declassified documents. There's also a weird deal that was struck at this time, which this I never heard of this until now uh, in regard to the Williams book, but I don't know much about this, and maybe some of us will never know much about this, but there was some sort of deal struck where the Vatican would allow the CIA to use its archives to store materials. And uh, I don't know exactly what that means or what it refers to, but it seems to have something to do with nuclear war and nuclear secrets, supposedly. So let's go to about 20... Three minutes in and <clears throat> William
Williams is going to talk about some uh, important stuff that you just heard me mention. Of, of nuclear uh, weapons. Oh, oh how is the Vatican? This is it. So, yeah. I mean, the relationship there became very, 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 very close. And uh, the CIA, as a matter of fact, began to uh, bug the Vatican and to uh, really rig the uh, papal... Uh, and you just heard Gordon Thomas say the exact same thing. Uh, conclaves to elect the Pope. The CIA is bugging and influencing the conclaves. You hear that? Now, I'm not in interested in any uh, set approvationist theories and uh, who, oh, there's a secret Pope and uh, who's, that we don't know about, but he's hiding away because he could, all this stupid stuff. The, the trad myths, that's all a bunch of myths, but it's interesting that, well, there is influence uh, in terms of who's elected. And guess, uh, the CIA... guess what that means? That means it's not the Holy Spirit electing the popes, is it? It's the geopolitical powers electing the pope, dummies. Initiate false flag attacks anywhere? Oh, are you kidding me? Well, that, see, that, that in Italy, what they wanted to do is they wanted to... Uh, they, 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 they wanted to make the communists look like uh, murderous barbarians. So, uh, and they, uh, what they would do is they would, they would, they would like plant a bomb in, in some place. A bomb would be detonated, and they, they would blame it on the Red Brigades. Uh, from 19, from January the first, 1969 to December 31st, 1987. Once again, this is all part of Gladio. Uh, Fifteen thousand false flag attacks. Uh, were monitored by the CIA and blamed on the commies. The most n noted, noted of these attacks were probably Piazza Fontana and Brescia, and of, of course the Bologna bombing. But th th it was very, it was very common that people grew to hate the communists because you know so many civilians were being killed. But now commies are bad, but this is also bad, right? And they're using these absolute loons out of the P2 Lodge and these soldiers that they had trained for these black ops to do this stuff that the OSS and CIA had trained. So these are not nice people. <laughs> okay. And I know, well, well we got to fight. That's how you fight a real war. No, oh, really? But so this is all funded through the Vatican bank. You see, that's the problem here, right? And this is why canon law had said, you're not supposed to be involved in this stuff. If you're a church person, you see, that's the point. That was the point yesterday. Are we are we seeing the same thing today with groups like ISIS? Yet when you watch these videos or you hear stories of burning, you know, captured pilots or beheading people, I am assuming that's real. George, let, what I can what I can tell you, uh, and uh, is is this that ISIS was created by us? Yes, I agree that, with. Uh, the General Valley, who is a, a, a spoke. I must get past the ISIS part because we want we're more interested in the Vatican part. Network that was set up from Southeast uh, Asia from, 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 uh, uh, from, from the Golden Triangle. Triangle. And uh, uh, what, what we what we, what we did, did when, when, when that came jeopardy, when the Viet Cong came to power, and that the uh, the flow of, of drugs from Thailand and Laos uh, and Burma was jeopardized because it, uh, Saigon was a distribution center. What happened? In 1964, Lyndon Bain Johnson appeared on, on television, and he said, look it, the North Vietnamese have just attacked our ship in the Gulf of Tonkin. There were American bodies of American sailors floating throughout the, the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. They, they fired, fired on us. And that was the fake flag uh, organized, uh, run by Admiral Morrison, Jim Morrison's dad. Anything. This is an act of war. And what happened because of, it never took place? The, the North right. Vietnamese never fired on any of our ships. None of that ever took place. There were no sailors floating in the, in the, the Gulf of Tonkin. No, no American was killed. It was, it was all a false Did alarm, Johnson... a false a, a report of a false attack yeah. that never took place. I, I agree. And because of that, George, we entered the Vietnam conflict, and at the end of the day, 1.3 million people were killed. 
Now we covered the uh, Douglas Valentine book Phoenix Program because the Vietnam the Vietnam conflict wasn't ultimately about communism. All right, and and I've done many videos on what I think Vietnam was really about. It was about social engineering. It was about the drug trade. It was about um, experimentation on troops, research and development for uh, drones. That's in the Andy Jackson book. Um, it was about demoralizing the West. It was about uh, what else? It was about this stuff, right? So you'll notice too that the mo <clears throat> remember when we covered the that the model for the reorganization and the, the terror that went on in uh, Vietnam, Phoenix program, that's the same model of what is Gladio. So what he's talking about with the fake flag terror is Gladio. That's the same thing as the model of Phoenix program stuff, terrorizing Viet Cong. Same thing. <laughs> and Gladio, by the way, in, included um, mass public um, pop pop events. Yes, you heard me right. I mean, we, 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 it goes, this was all part of Gladio. Now, this is where it gets controversial. You say that our current pope was involved in Gladio. Explain that. Now, remember yesterday when I read Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus? What did he talk about? He talked about this. He talked about Operation Condor. Operation Condor is the continuation of Gladio. And it's the same model of the Phoenix program, which Valentine talks about. Because they took the Phoenix program research and they exported it to Latin and South America for the death squad model there. Now, again, does that mean that the communists are the good guys? No, I'm not saying that. I'm trying to say that either of these masters is going to be bad guys. That's my point. But to fall into the mindset of thinking that good guy, bad guy, right, is to be duped by the dialectic. That's the point. Now I lost my place. Where was I at? Here we go. Well, the, our current pope, in, in look, Gladio was not just confined to Italy and to and to Western Europe. I mean, there there were attacks uh, the, the, be, be, besides Bologna that were that were occurring. You know, uh, at the same time, monumental attacks. Uh, but in South America. Uh, Operation Glad uh, Gladio became known as Operation Condor, and uh, this represented once again an attempt to suppress liberation theology and to do away with communism and to set up right-wing di dictatorships. The first part of Operation Condor there was the overthrow of Salvador Allende in Chile and the installation of uh, Hugo Banzar Suarez in Bolivia, but in in, in answer to your question, in Argentina, we uh, mounted a coup that was led by General Jorge Videla, who was a very good friend of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Jorge Maria Bergoglio, who is the current pope. And this coup in, in Argentina, going back in 1976, was supervised by Henry Kissinger. And Videla launched a per Now remember... Who, I think, was it, who's Klaus's mentor? Was that Whitney Webb's article or Johnny Vedmore's article? I'm trying to remember. I know the Johnny Vedmore has the article about Kissinger <clears throat> recruiting Klaus out of the Harvard Research Project for Davos. But there's another one that deals with Klaus's mentor being a cardinal, isn't it? Who is, I think. Ooh, yeah, this is it. Yeah. Now, this is relevant because I think he is a BFF of Francis. So here is, and again, all of this is just showing the, the compromised geopolitical situation of the Vatican, uh, not just in the 20th century especially, but more and more uh, evident nowadays. Well, let's see about this guy. It says, <clears throat> I need more of my sipping jug here. <clears throat> Uh, 
so all this world economic forum pushing of austerity pushing of all this stuff the great reset um Cardinal Viganu uh, apparently is very well of this, ironically, who wrote this letter to Trump that people have heard of. But <clears throat> Michael Matt released a video about Trump, Davos, Great Reset. Here we go. <clears throat> Michael Matt outlines the intimate connections between Klaus and Brazilian Archbishop Camara. Camara was the council father at Vatican II known as the Red Bishop due to his... <clears throat> Condemnation of American anti-communism. Praising of Mal, <laughs> Mao Zedong. Oh, man. By the way, so you see, I'm, I'm saying that it's at this level of like super rich people, communism, capitalism, they don't mean anything. They're just tools, dude. So don't fall into this trad cap mindset of like, oh, but it, it's, it's us against the commies. It's not the Cold War. Okay, the, the Fortune 100, 500, they're not commies. They don't. They're not. They're not in Moscow. Okay, the for, did you think the KGB runs the Fortune 500, the Fortune 100? No. So Kamara is a proponent of liberation theology. <clears throat> he was a, a huge contributor to Gaudi et Spes. Exactly. <laughs> and. I wanted to make sure because I, I was pretty sure that isn't Kamara Klaus's mentor. Isn't he buddies with Pope Frank? That's what I'm trying to remember if that's right. Let's see if this is it. Uh, let's see. So his name is Archbishop Kamara, not Cardinal. And let's see if he is, if I remember correctly, that he is uh, friends of Frank. If they're close. <laughs> Whoa, they're going to try to make him a saint. So the liberation theologians are going to be saints now. That's it. Yeah. It'd be fun to see the, how they deal with, how the Roman Catholics deal with this one. Ooh. So yes, Francis in his annual address to the Roman Curia, Calls liberation theologian Camara the holy bishop of Brazil. And you'll notice that all the, they're all trying to figure out if he's a commie or not. So look, the battle isn't commies, right? Communism and capitalism are flip sides of the same coin. Some of these people, yeah, they believe communism. But communism has never been a movement that was organic or without zillionaire funding. And that's the key thing we have to understand. Of all the leftists in Argentina and over 30,000 Argentines uh, disappeared. And they disappeared because they were loaded uh, uh, in, in, on cargo planes and, uh, and, and uh, they were flown to the middle of the ocean and thrown off the planes. What? 30,000 oh, yeah. people dumped 30, into the 000. ocean? 30,000. And the Catholic Church supported uh, Videl and it, it supported the Junta. Did these people think they were fleeing Argentina or what? Oh, no, no, no. It's all documented now. It's, uh, it all, it's, uh, it I all mean, why, why did they get on the plane? They were forced on the plane. Oh, they were forced on the plane. They were right. rounded up, forced on the plane, in, in, in cargo planes, transported uh, uh, over the ocean and dumped off. And that thirty thousand, at least thirty thousand. That's a that's that's a, uh, at a at a minimum disappeared. They're all the in the they they're all in these cargo planes. planes. They open up the back door and they probably fl all, fly at an angle and they slide down or something. Huh? And 
Anyway, we're not going to, uh, you, I do recommend listening to the rest of this interview because, uh, it does get into a lot of interesting details, especially about Archbishop Marcinkus, who was the head of Vatican bank. And then was also the head of the, uh, cocaine bank in, uh, what's that one called? Cecil Pine Bank. Cecil Pine Bank was one of the Vatican holding companies in the Bahamas that laundered cocaine money, headed by Archbishop Marcinkus, head of the Vatican Bank. And of course, yes, the papacy got a cut from that. So, cope all you want, whatever. This is who runs your church. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So, I don't hate trads. I don't hate any individual trads. Plenty of corrupt bishops in the uh, Orthodox world, sure. Um, but this is what's going on with the Vatican. So any, what, what any of that has to do with Peter and the new Testament, I don't know. All right. Two hours and 20 minutes. I'm getting tired again. So we might have to, uh, was there anything else we want to talk about? <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, he goes on that interview to talk about the fact that, uh, so the Vatican bank during this time period couldn't actually handle the billions of dollars that was coming, that were coming through drug money. So they actually set up a separate bank to help with this. Um, I think this leads to, uh, Paul Hellowell and Meyer Lansky set up the castle bank and trust in Miami. Um, millions, of, I don't know. It doesn't say, it, but many, many millions disappeared. This bank disappeared. Then another bank was set up, the Nugent Hand Bank. This is a famous drug money laundering bank to funnel money from the Golden Triangle drug trade. Uh, the Nugent Hand Bank was set up in Australia. Um, uh, Zbig uh, is who. Paul Williams identifies as one of these key figures for the continuation of Gladio. Um, Williams argues that the Feta Gulen network was a big part of this and that the control of Turkey is a big puzzle piece for the, uh, the, the West to control Eurasia. We know that's, you know, the model here for, uh, NATO, for Russia, for what's going on in the Ukraine. Brzezinski has multiple books talking about that. We just interviewed Colonel Douglas McGregor about that. But also, uh, Zabig had the strategy of Turkey for part of the controlling of Eurasia and its resources, which is why this uh, Gulen figure uh, played so largely into this, why the CIA supported the Fethullah Gulen network. And um, the weird things about Gulen, supposedly he's worth $50 billion in assets. Um, and he is this supposed scholar, but he has a third, he has a third grade level education. <laughs> So that, that's just a cutout, obviously. Um, anyway. The purpose then, uh, by a lot of the stuff that's set up, right, and the, the co-opting the Vatican Bank is, again, to launder, launder money uh, for black operations. Um, this was run by Archbishop Marcinkus. This is what led to uh, the famous incident of Roberto Calvi being killed uh, because John Paul I... Uh, who was supposedly a very simple man, uh, not that not that smart, not that swift. John Paul I had the idea to clean up the Vatican Bank. Okay, well, apparently he didn't realize what he was getting into because the Vatican Bank was laundering money for Western intelligence together with the P2 Lodge. And this is all referencing in Godfather 3. It's the P2 Lodge that has John Paul I killed. That's the whole point of the movie. It's, it's the whole final third act is referencing what this is all about. And this, uh, there's a great article by Neil Clark on how this helped solidify the uh, victory of the West in terms of the Cold War. I'm not going to read all this, but I recommend you go read it. It's, it's a classic essay by Neil Clark. It's really good. Um, but really, the what, what's going on here is that this private intelligence setup is set up by the DuPonts, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies. That's the CIA, OSS CIA. The people who are running the OSS and, and CIA are part of the CFR. The stated goal of the CFR is to eliminate the U.S. in terms of its sovereignty and to create a new world order. There's also borrowing, as we said. You'll notice the CIA support for the Fatullah Gulen network to control a version of Islam. That's an older British intelligence model of allying with Islam. Where do we see that? 
the Milner Fabian book. We just covered that. Same, same plan, same model. So it is the State Department that s continues this foreign policy uh, approach because the State Department is uh, told what to do and run by people in the CFR and the Trilateral Commission, as we have said and lectured for many, many years. There's another article at Mother Jones about this, uh, the close relationship between <clears throat> John Paul II and the CIA. <laughs> Here's another essay on what you've heard me talking about tonight that I'll put in the chat also. And then we'll go to the super chats because that's the essence of what I wanted to get to tonight. I think we've covered all the, the highlights um, and we had some fun on the way. If you would hit like and share, guys, good news. Guess what? There's a new promo. Yes, you heard me right. 60% off. It's back. Now, it's not back for everything. But it's back for the recurring subscriptions. If you want to get a, a recurring subscription over at Chalk.com, our wonderful show sponsor, you can do that now using the promo code J60LIFE. J60LIFE. That gives you 60% off now all the Chalk products. Go ahead and use that promo code now. Sign up for the recurring subscriptions for the excellent Irish Moss. If you are a lady, you want to balance out your hormones, Irish Moss is great for that. Uh, Action 2.0, overall energy support, overall supplementation, da the daily, chalk daily. You want <clears throat> to focus on mental clarity? She legit. She legit. Right? Your brain is fried? Why would this fry your brain? If your brain is fried, you need some of that she legit. That'll help you categorize and, 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 and feed on and soak in all of this information. Tomcat 100, if you want to boost testosterone in a powerful way, get the Tomcat Elite, the Tomcat 100. All of these uh, products are purified with the strongest possible levels of purification in terms of the chalk.com uh, process of purification. Everything is better than organic is, is, is what I understand. I mean, I don't go and overview their process, but, you know, comparing chalk.com and turn, especially just look at the reviews, head on, head on over to chalk and look at those reviews. You'll notice the hundreds of positive reviews. Everybody loves chalk. You're going to want that recurring subscription. If you don't, if you want to support this show, use the promo code, or excuse me, use the super chat function. But uh, again, you can still, I think, use the uh, promo code uh, J50 for if you want to try out the products, but if you want the, re the recurring subscription, now they've brought back the 60% off J60 life, J six zero L I F E. You got to use the promo promo code and, uh, head on over to chalk.com for that right now. Super chats. That keeps me going. Let's go to, uh, boom, boomerius Techaeus boomer tech $3. Thank you so much. Boomer tech. That will go into the, uh, fund for trying to figure out the audio issues that have forever been an issue. They, I, I've just kind of accepted that they're, they're always going to be an issue. I mean, we might look at stream yards though, because that might be, although I don't know that stream yards will, will fix the problem of playing the clips, right? I don't know why they can't, like, it seems like it should just be really simple to turn on a live stream and to play a clip for people. But it requires all this, like, jump through all these hoops and hours of figuring out the patches. and It's just ridiculous, right? Rock B, $10. <clears throat> Dr. Janine Constantino says Proto-Evangelium of James is heresy. Well, I mean, it's not part of the canon of Scripture. So, yet it is within the liturgical calendar, right? Well, the tradition of the church can reference things out of documents that we don't accept, right? Like Shepherd of Hermas, right? That's not part of the canon of scripture, but it might contain tradition, right? The book of Enoch, it's referenced in the book of Jude, right? So that doesn't make it canon. No, nor war $5. <laughs> if you listen to Paul Williams in this interview on Operation Gladio, and then if you read Jay and, and the Wim Hof stuff, the CIA doctrine warfare program, Vatican II makes perfect sense. Don't one led to the other. Absolutely. That's exactly right. 
and that's our buddy I think who called in and had the really good comments on natural theology and lo- and logi and all that. Day gyre five dollars. Here's the tech upgrade. Well, the weird part is that a tech. I mean, there's nothing wrong. All the product, the the actual hardware we have here is like expensive, high quality stuff, right? I mean, hundreds of dollars for the lights, hundreds of dollars for the, uh, you know, the HD 4K camera. I don't do 4K because I can't. It's too much, too much bandwidth to live stream. Um, you know, we've got freaking thousand dollar cameras for other stuff. The the Nikon camera I bought. Uh, I mean, the, the, we've got multiple Max. I mean, it's the, the, not hardware. Right. It's just the, it's compatibility is the problem across different <clears throat> brands and companies. And I'm not, I don't really care. I'm not a techie person. I don't really care about all this tech stuff. Uh, I think all this tech stuff is annoying and, and, and dumb and boring. Henry $5. Where does evil come from according to orthodoxy? Well, there's moral evil and then there's evil in a sense of a privation or a metaphysical sense. Right. So if you mean by evil, um, the pri- private sense, sometimes we speak of evils in the sense of lack, right? It's an evil that, uh, you know, if I lack eyesight, that's an evil. It's not moral evil, right? Moral evil is a movement of the will away from the good. So it's a transgression of divine law. It is also typically described as a privation, right? So evil itself doesn't have ontological being because it's a movement against or away from being or the good. I heard you think God doesn't create it. Correct. Right. That would be a Manichaean view. If you believe that evil is a creature or has an actual being, that's called Manichaeanism and that's a Gnostic heresy. When God created the world in Genesis, he said it is good. So he doesn't create evil in a literal sense. If you're going to refer to the text in the Bible that talk about, I create evil and bring, bring the good. It's not talking about an ontological being called evil. Kristen, $5. One more super chance. Thank you so much. Eli G, $3. I thought your conversation with Colonel Douglas McGregor was great. Thank you so much. Will you talk to Scott Ritter? Sure. I would talk to Scott Ritter. Pete Quinone. Uh, Yeah. I don't think uh, those people have asked for an interview, but I would do an interview. Another one. Uh, And I don't know Scott Ritter, but maybe. Harry Serpanos, not Sopranos, Serpanos. <laughs> Here's ten dollars for the singing from a near boomer, sixty six. I'm a Gen X Greek Orthodox ex fossil. What's an ex fossil that needs to be entertained? Well, we try to give. Uh, I try to be an entertaining, an entertaining person, uh, just because that's, that's my personality. Thank you so much, though. Black. I'm. St- I still. <clears throat> I am still sick, so that's why I'm kind of winding down and my voice is going out. Black pill in sell five dollars. What are your th- thoughts on dating black pill? Oh, the dating like I don't date anymore because I'm black pilled. Um, it's probably harder if you're younger, but I wouldn't. I would just put it in God's hands because God can do anything. He can bring you somebody who's good willed and good hearted. So, uh, you know, just don't give up. If I'm a man is ugly. Should he throw in the towel and become a monk? Yeah, I don't think that monasticism should be done because you're ugly. Like, those aren't good reasons. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. Like, you know, just like, oh, I'm a based trad cat, so I'm going to become orthodox because I'm politically based. That's not the right reason to become orthodox. You should become orthodox because you believe the theology, right? So likewise... You don't become a monk because oh, I'm ugly and I'm not going to get laid, right? Those are those aren't good reasons. Um, you know, I guess it depends on how unattractive you are. Like, you know, there's there's always ways to improve one's appearance. So you know, it might be hard work, but you know, who said anything in life was you know not going to require hard work? Palantir one dollar on Easter Sunday. Did the father re- reject Christ? Or did he re- reject himself? So, um, <clears throat> Jesus, every action of the Trinity is Trinitarian. So each person in the Trinity will have their own unique role in that single act. 
So the father had a role in res resurrecting the son. The son had a role in the resurrection as well. And so did the spirit. That's true for any Trinitarian act. Palantir, $1. This is a sensitive topic, but in order to gain a better understanding of scripture, if you can't discuss it here, is there a book that discusses it? My question is, is there an orthodox exegesis of Matthew 27, 25? Let's see, Matthew 27, 25. Matthew 27, 25. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but I mean, there's probably an Orthodox exegesis from somebody, some church father. It's probably, it's where we would start. So probably, um, you have the Katina app if you want. Uh, I think, you know, Chris system has lectures through Matthew. I'm not sure if he gets to Matthew 27 or not, but all right. I can't, still can't see the, I can't see this stuff anymore. My eyes are boomer now. Oh, um, yeah, there probably is a orthodox exegesis of it, but every sin can be forgiven. If that, if that helps clear things up without, <laughs> without talking about things that are too dangerous for the algorithm. Palantir dollar is heaven and paradise and new earth synonymous. I uh, know. I think new heavens, and new earth means this world, this universe gets renewed. So that's not identical to the third heavens, the throne room of God. Those are different places. So when we're resurrected in bodies, we'll have bodies in a new heavens and a new earth. So they're different places. But also heaven is present in the sense of, uh, you know, the liturgy and whatnot in this life, even now. JML, $40. Just War, Liberation, Theology, or CIE Constructs? No, so Just War goes back to um, the Latin medieval uh, argumentation. I mean, Aquinas talks about Just War, going, going from memory. So no, that wouldn't be a CIE construct. But uh, Liberation Theology is, is a little uh, more of a hairy topic because the weird part is that Liberation Theology has typically a lot of socialist and Marxist obvious connections, right? So most people involved in Liberation Theology had Marxist leanings. But the problem is that this goes above the Cold War dialectic because a lot of very wealthy people uh, like Rockefeller interests were pro-liberation theology. So that's why this is confusing to a lot of people. I remember the doctrines of the mainstream justification and Clinton's war on Serbia in the 90s. Uh, was liberation theology? Or you mean just war? Interesting. I mean, that was all just like the same you know, Western Atlantis's power block as we talked about with Colonel McGregor. So, but I don't remember, I didn't know there was any just war ju uh, argumentation for the bombing of Serb Bosnia and Serbia. I, I didn't know that. Palantir $1. Jay, I struggle with uh, bodily interest into heaven. Why? Uh, I mean, Jesus has a body. He went to heaven in the ascension. So I don't, I don't understand what's the problem. Heaven is not like a realm of thought. What about Elijah and the chariot? Jesus gaining altitude. So, so you understand that when Jesus ascended, like he went from earth to the first heavens, which is like the atmosphere the second heavens is space. The third heavens is God's throne. So like he literally went up into the third heavens outside of space to God's throne. But God's throne is also here and now in this life in the liturgy. So when Elijah ascended in the chariot, it's my understanding that Elijah went to paradise like Enoch. So Enoch and Elijah have not died they are in another place called paradise awaiting to, you know, come back presumably and to die. If you are downloading a browser extension that boosts audio levels in your stream, there's one at Chrome. Yeah, I've never used Chrome, so but maybe I should. I mean, I've never used Chrome for or for this kind of stuff, but I could try that. Orthodox Imperium $5. If your streaming software captures your desktop audio, 
then you can, I don't know how to do all that. Open streams and VLC tools affect filter compressor to force the audio levels to higher without crazy amplification. You can open YouTube streams in VLC. I don't know if I can figure all that out, man. I'm sorry. I mean, maybe. But the problem is not just opening the YouTube stream in VLC. It's that you have to run it through OBS, which maybe you're saying you can do that. I don't know. Anyway, if you would hit like and share. And uh, thank you guys so much. And we will uh, return in the next couple days with uh, you know some more of the papacy streams. We'll get back probably to more of the theological stuff. Uh or maybe we won't just talk about the papacy. So I'm, I'm actually really enjoying the Borgias. So we might do something, uh, throw a little curveball and do a, a podcast. Jamie might join me on the Borgias. And um, what else? Yeah, so we'll do that. And anyway, we're going to keep it going. Hope you guys are enjoying it. If you would hit like and share. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just a cold. I'm good. Everybody have a good night.